Hey everyone, Cody Hayes here, and I'd like to welcome you to part two as we look at the second portion of Christianity, explaining the Great Schism. And we left off with one of the early controversies within uh, the Christian realm, which is essentially, you know, how is it that you're claiming to be a monotheistic religion believing in one God when it seems like you believe in three gods? Well, Arius of Alexandria, who was a priest in Alexandria, presbyter slash priest, he believed that he had a solution to that issue. And essentially, you know, he held that the Father and that the Father alone was God. So God is the Father, end of story. But, well, what about Jesus and the Holy Spirit? You know, how do they factor into all this? Well, Jesus, Arius held that he was God's son, and that he was God-like, but that he was not God. So Jesus, you know, he's the Son of God. He's God-like in that he has, you know, many, you know, powers. He's He's got a lot of unique powers, you know, godlike powers, we could say, but, you know, he's not God. You could perhaps put him as the, the highest of the saints, but he's not God. Um, I've been asked before, you know, how did Arius look at what's called the opening, the prologue of the Gospel of John? Uh, even though the Bible, as we would currently conceive of it, did not exist yet, a lot of the books which, you know, are composed of it and would become, you know, part of it, uh, did exist. One of them being the Gospel of John, and a lot of these works, you know, had strong favoring, you know, within the Christian world, the Gospel of John being one. And, you know, of the writings of Arius that we do still have available... Arius, you know, essentially, you know, took kind of the beginning there of the prologue, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word came down in the flesh, that, you know, Jesus was essentially, you know, the spoken Word of God. When he spoke, he spoke with God's authority, but again, he was not God. That, you know, only the Father is God. Now, as for the Holy Spirit... You know, he held that the Holy Spirit was the force of God in the world, the force that God sends out, but again, is not God. So, you know, again, for Arius, the Father and the Father alone is God. That's who God is. You know, Jesus, he's the Son of God. He, you know, he, had, he has godlike powers, but, you know, he's not God. And the Holy Spirit is, you know, this force that God sends out into the world, but again, it's not God. Only the Father is God. And, you know, Arius was essentially told by his bishop, Alexander, to shut up. But he continued to preach, you know, his message. And, you know, it's important to point out, you know, during this time, there were two dominant Christian schools. One was in Antioch, the other was in Alexandria. Arius, while he was a priest in Alexandria, he was trained at the school in Antioch. And at the Antioch school, they had really a strong emphasis on the humanity of Jesus. They didn't deny his divinity, but they focused very heavily on his humanity. Whereas the Alexandria school focused more on the divinity of Jesus, didn't, didn't excuse me, didn't deny, you know, his uh, humanity, but focused very heavily on his divinity. But moving on, the church stepping in. This is an image here of the Bishop of Rome, Sylvester I, the Pope greeting the Emperor Constantine at Nicaea, even though this didn't actually take place. The Pope, in fact, never left Rome. He sent some representatives there to Nicaea. But, in 325 CE, Constantine, the Roman Emperor, he asked the bishops of the Church to come together and deal with the theology of Arius.
Now, you know, again, Constantine, he's the sole emperor of Rome, and he feels that, you know, the Christian conception of God allowed him to achieve what he has achieved, so he is favoring this movement, and now he sees, you know, this presbyter slash priest from Alexandria and this theology he's putting forward as dividing the church. So essentially, you know, he asked the bishops of the church, the bosses, to get together and, you know, deal with the theology that Arius is putting forward. Well, the bishops of the church, or their representatives, they gathered at a place called Nicaea for what has gone down in history as the First Ecumenical Council. So, you know, like I mentioned just a few moments ago, uh, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, he never actually left Rome. He sent some individuals to represent him at the Council. But this has gone down in history as what's called the First Ecumenical Council, the First Council of Nicaea. Um, in the Book of Acts, in the canonical New, excuse me, New Testament, there is what's called the Council of Jerusalem, and the Council of Jerusalem has kind of been looked upon as a proto-council uh, to what took place in Nicaea, and I'd say partially because, um, you know, there were, at this point, you could say, you know, bishops, individuals, you know, in charge, you know, more than just the, the twelve, you could say, and, you know, we don't know how many of them were you know present in Jerusalem so you know this has kind of gone down for certain as what you know would be called an ecumenical council and also you know there is the the arguments that were considered you know very binding here whereas in the case with the council of Jerusalem that's a lot of what was discussed there was more kind of relevant to the particular circumstances you know of that time you know, regarding the issue of circumcision and, you know, a lot of the elements with the Torah, which was a, another early problem, you know, or issue within, you know, earlier Christianity, we could say. In any case, moving on. Uh, the decisions of the bishop, or the decision of the bishops, you know, condemned the theology of Arius, and it defined for the first time, more or less, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, which is summarized in what's called the Nicene Creed. Uh, it was enlarged at the next ecumenical council, Constantinople I. So, you know, the, the theology, the doctrine of Arius is condemned. And, you know, there are those that have asked, you know, what happened to Arius? And I think there's almost this view that somehow he was killed. Uh, he wasn't killed. Um, he, his, his movement, his theology, you know, lived on. And it lived on until at least uh, the 8th century, you know, what could be called an Arian form of Christianity. And essentially it died out on its own. Um, there were some bishops... And I would say that Eusebius, the early church historian and bishop of Caesarea, you know, who perhaps were a little bit sympathetic to Arius because Arius never was really allowed to, you know, explain his views because he wasn't a bishop, he was a priest. And so there were those that felt, you know, maybe he wasn't given a fair shake. But um, the group that is officially known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, but whom we commonly refer to as Jehovah's Witnesses, they are often called uh, contemporary Arians because they essentially hold to the Christology that Arius put forward back in the early 4th century. But, in any case, Arius's theology is condemned by the bishops of the Catholic Orthodox movement. 
and you have what was essentially put forward what's called the Nicene Creed it's enlarged at the next ecumenical council Constantinople the first which took place in 381 CE or AD you don't need to write this down but here is the Nicene Creed and I have on the screen an icon of the Holy Trinity again you don't need to write this down but we believe in one God the Father the Almighty maker of heaven and and earth of all things seen and unseen we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ the only Son of God eternally begotten of the Father God from God light from light true God from true God begotten not made one in being with the Father through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit he was born of the Virgin Mary and became a man and for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate he suffered and died and was buried, but on the third day he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From henceforth he shall come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. You might notice that's in brackets. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Okay. Basically, the theology, you know, regarding the Trinity is that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct persons, but they have one divine nature. So they are one God in that respect. Now, that doesn't completely mean that it did not stop, you know, some of the controversy. Um, just to kind of emphasize on that, uh, the Middle East is, you know, predominantly Muslim. But at one time, it was predominantly Christian. And there are historians that have argued that a main reason why it is not today predominantly Christian has to do with the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Because one of the things within Christianity is that you don't have to necessarily understand a doctrine, you just have to believe it. So like for example, you don't necessarily have to understand how Jesus is really present in the Eucharist, the Holy Communion. You just have to believe that he is. But it helps if you're able to understand a particular teaching. So, you know, when you know church leaders are say explaining the doctrine of the trinity and stating how you know father son and holy spirit are three distinct persons but they have one divine nature therefore they're one god and individuals are like okay if you say so it sounds like three gods to us but okay if you say so and then of course you have you know muhammad or, you know, some of the early Muslim missionaries, you know, going through the Middle East and saying, no, 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 there's none of this three in one. There's one God, one solid God, end of story, period. And, you know, to a lot of those individuals, they're like, well, that's a lot easier to grasp or understand. I can understand that. I can grasp that. You know, that kind of thing. Well, we're going to need to stop here, but... Um, when we continue on, we will look more at, you know, how it is that the Great Schism took place, how it is that the United Catholic Orthodox Faith divided into two factions, which still exist today, the Catholic side and then the Orthodox side. So take care. I will symbolically see you then.